Dialectical Materialism by Henry Lefebvre. This is part one of chapter two, the production of man. Inasmuch as he is a natural being, man is given, says the manuscript of 1844. At the starting point of his production, therefore, we find biological and material nature, with all its mystery and tragedy, transformed yet present, this nature will constantly be appearing in the content of human life. Nature, being that is, can be explored and expressed poetically, plastically, or scientifically. If it were defined, both art and science would become redundant and their autonomy and movement abolished. Such a definition would simply be a metaphysical abstraction. The modern mind is only just beginning to sense the depth of the natural will to live with its con contrasts and ambivalences, its intimate blend of aggressiveness and sympathy, its tumultuous energies and its periods of calm, its destructives, furies, and its joy. What do they conceal or signify these biological energies, which the reason must organize and pacify, but not destroy. Perhaps as Hegel and the embry embryologists believed, they contain the whole past of organic life. No doubt they also transform profoundly their inorganic and organic elements, man's instincts and animals. Our biological energies cannot be determined only by the past of the species, but also by the future they contain within them. To start with, man was a biological possibility, although this possibility was able to be actualized only after a long struggle, in which man has increasingly assumed responsibility for his own being. His activity becomes power and will. Painfully, he acquires consciousness. Inasmuch as he is knowledge and existence in the flesh, he becomes the living idea of nature. But he does not cease to belong to nature. His energies are immersed in those of nature, where they are renewed, renewed and destroyed. These energies are also perhaps a refinement as well as, from certain points of view, an exhaustion of the fundamental energies. The becoming is multiform. Evolution, revolution, involution. A descent seen from one side, an ascent seen from another. The role of philosophical thought is to eliminate premature explanations, those limitative positions which would prevent us from penetrating and possessing the formidable content of our being. All we can say is that nature is not inert, and that it is not an already real soul or spirit, that we must not picture it as a brute externality or object, or sum of objects nor as a pure internality or subject, or sum of subjects, because nature is presupposed in the birth and appearance of subject and object. The best picture we can have of nature in itself, independent of ourselves, is a negative one, no doubt. Nature is indifferent, which does not mean that it is hostile or brutally alien to us, but rather undifferentiated in relation to the object and subject of our own experience. Inasmuch as he is a natural being, man contains a multiplicity of instincts, tendencies, and vital forces. As such, he is passive and limited. The objective need of a natural flesh and blood being requires an object that is also natural. The objects of man's natural instincts, hunger, sexual instinct, as such are outside him and independent of him. He depends on them. His need and vital force are thus transformed into powerlessness and privation. The relation between a being and its other is thus given in nature and experienced existentially by natural man as externality and dependence. Since he has other beings for his object, this man is an object for other beings. He is at once a subject and an object which are opposed yet inseparable. A material subject, objectively given in his organism an elementary biological consciousness, and thus containing a relation with other beings who are, for him, the objects of his desire, 
but in themselves subjects, a material object for these other beings. The fact that he is thus an object exposes natural man to the designs and aggressions of other living beings. However, a being who is not objective would be an absurdity. He would be alone in an unbearable metaphysical solitude. We cease to be alone not when we are with someone else, but when we are ourselves someone else, another reality than ourselves for ourselves, another reality than the object for itself. A meeting of pure subjects, monads, would not draw them out from their solitude. A being who is not the object of a, of a desire for another being has no determinable existence. As soon as I have an object, that being has me for object. The natural being, therefore, has his nature outside himself, and this is how he participates in nature. In this fundamental experience, nature is determined for us as an externality of elements. But, as Hegel said, the most external is also the most internal. Natural beings are closely linked and dependent on each other, even in their externality, and in their struggles against each other. Natural man as such is passive inasmuch as he feels this passivity that is the thrust of his desire together with the impotence of that desire. He becomes passionate. Passion, says Marx, is an essential force in the man tended towards his object. Passion is thus given its place. It cannot be condemned by the reason because the passionate man derives his strength from the most profound energies of nature. And yet passion as as such must be only the basis and starting point of power. Power no longer depends on the object. It dominates and contains its object. The objectivity of nature is no longer anything more than its limit and its end. For man is not only a being of nature, he is also human. In and through man, nature is divided and opposed to itself and enters into a conflict with itself more profound than all its previous contrasts and all the conflicts between individuals or biological species. Man, a being of nature, turns and fights against nature. For him, nature is the primal source, the mother, yet it is nothing more than the given substance on which he acts. Inasmuch as it is external nature, is even his death and his tomb. This other existential experience, to use a modern term, is equally fundamental. Human objects are no longer immediately natural objects, specifically human feelings, such as manifest themselves objectively, are no longer the natural human objectivity, brute desire, or immediate sensibility. Nature ceases to be present immediately and adequately to man. Like every natural being, man must be born. His theory is the act of his birth, his coming into being within nature, and yet outside and against nature. In the course of this history, man erects himself above nature and slowly brings it under control. History is the natural history of man, says Marx. But this birth is a transcending, and an increasingly conscious transcending. By acting, man modifies nature, both around and within him. He creates his own nature by acting on nature. He transcends himself in nature and transcends nature in himself. By shaping it to his own requir requirements, he modifies himself in his own activity and creates fresh requirements for himself. He forms himself and grasps himself as a power by creating objects or products. He progresses by resolving in action the problems posed by his action. The negativity the negativity of the object and its transcending thus have a positive significance. Object and subject are equally positive and objective. It is in order to attain to the object which is outside it that the activity of the subject posits new objects and transcends its natural dependence vis-a-vis -vis objects. Activity thus posits itself as an object. It attains to itself, becomes conscious of itself and acts on itself through the object. It transcends the opposition between subject and object by recovering itself in this objectivity that is superior to natural objectivity. 
The one-sidedness of philosophical attitudes has been determined by the limitation of their first step. Idealism, which began with pure activity, independent of its content, led necessarily to a formalization of this activity. Positivism, empiricism, or even ordinary materialism started by positing the object, datum or fact, independently of activity. They therefore ignored this activity and limited actual being. A philosophical method which sets out to express man's activity in its completeness must start from a richer notion than that of the brute object or pure activity. The notion of the product represents a higher unity and epitomizes activity.